The end of captivity marks the secession of evil. More than the captives are returned. The new policies of Persia. And the wanderers. All that and more coming up next on Bible Discovery TV. Quick study. Stay there. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, where we're taking you through the Bible chronologically. Now, today, we're going to study, in fact, Ezra chapter 1 to 3. And Ezra 1 says, the end of captivity marked the secession of evil. What in the world is that about? We'll talk about that coming up in just a moment. But right now, Corey is here with Bible history and archaeology. Corey? Today, we are learning more about Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, who gave that famous edict to allow the Judeans to go home and rebuild the temple. All right, going home and rebuilding the temple, and Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? Well, today we're talking about how the magnetic fields of some of the planets in our own solar system create a lot of issues for those who believe that the solar system is billions of years old. All right, so the solar system, I don't know, how old is it? We'll find out later. It's coming up. Now, what about you for Bible discovery and, well, and archaeology? In the, in the exile, Nebuchadnezzar had taken articles from the house of God and placed them in the temple of his gods. In the return of the exile, King Cyrus brings out the articles to be counted and returned to Jerusalem. Do you know how many articles were removed, counted, and returned? Today we begin our study in the book of Ezra. Now, Ezra chapter 1 opens up with an edict from King Cyrus of Persia. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at the archaeological remains of this edict. One of the most deadly, cunning, and effective military leaders of history has recently been touted as one of the world's first civil rights activists. King Cyrus the Great of Persia led his empire with a mixture of uncompromising violence and religious freedom for conquered people. With his new political take, he conquered the empire of Babylon, in which was found the exiled people of Israel and Judah. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah had written over a hundred years before Cyrus a direct message for him from God, preserved today as Isaiah chapter 45. The books of 2 Chronicles and Ezra have this fulfilled prophecy recorded, part of King Cyrus's decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Today, we know of King Cyrus's politics through the Bible and a cylindrical object that's nine inches long by four inches wide. This document was written in ancient Akkadian and discovered in 1879 in Babylon. It's believed to have been a foundation stone, a commemorative text written for Cyrus as he rebuilt Babylon. The text speaks of Babylon and Cyrus and also outlines a critical policy. Cyrus allowed previously captive peoples to return to their homelands to rebuild their religious sanctuaries with public funding and their previously plundered costly religious icons. This is exactly what the Bible claims King Cyrus did for Israel. Once again, history as we unbury it is showing the Bible's account trustworthy. 
Another tremendous discovery was made in early 2010. Two fragments of a copy of the cylinder were found in the British Museum. These pieces originally came from a city south of Babylon, meaning there was a copy very close by in another important city of that day. It gives strong evidence to the fact that the cylinder's contents were distributed around the Persian Empire as an imperial decree of the king. God made serious preparation for Cyrus, the Persian king ruling at the time of Ezra and recording the message highlighted in today's scriptures. Now, as he left to go to Jerusalem, Ezra mentioned Cyrus in his kingdom and his message for the world. He also addressed the Jewish people willing to go back to Jerusalem after 70 harsh years of bondage. This is a remarkable message since long before his birth, Cyrus's name is actually mentioned in the Bible. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shezbejar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Ses Bazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is Ezra chapters 1 to 3 as we focus on this passage of Scripture today and we hurdle our mind around this. Now, Ezra is after the exiles, but the time comes before the exiles when he is actually true to be a part of what's happening. And so the man comes 70 years after the exile and he sets it up. Now, this is interesting as we explore this, so let us look at what the scripture says. But first, let's look at the overview. The overview is interesting. It is strong gifts. Now, the second most important man in Israel's history, the first being Moses, the second would be Ezra. Because Ezra is the man who brings back the Mosaic law, brings back the Levites and everybody into that. For that, he needs strong gifts. 
So his reading assignment or our reading assignment is Ezra chapter one to three. That's important because that keeps us chronologically in design with the word today. Now then, we are going to focus on Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. There are three points that we're going to mention in this program. The fourth point is on the Bible guide. I encourage you to check it out. So with this in mind, we come to Ezra chapter 1 as we introduce this scripture, verses 1 to 4. Now in the first year of Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, that word, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of the king Cyrus of Persia so that he would make a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put in writing, and he said this, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all of the kingdoms of the earth. That's all the earth, folks, right there it is. And the Lord God also of heaven has given me, he wants to say, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. That's interesting. Verse three, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God. Notice that he is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him to be with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the freewill offerings of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, this is interesting because the king, a Persian king of all of the uh, kingdom of that day, announces to the world, and actually says, God told me to do this. Now, of course, he is in prophecy, and it's mentioned in Isaiah that he's in prophecy, and that inspires him. So that brings me to the first point as we look at it. The end of captivity is marked by the cessation of the evil rule that God planned and permitted. Now, this is a hard one for a lot of people to accept, but God was judging Israel. Now, during that time that God was judging Israel, it's important for you to know that he permitted evil to rule. Now, some of that evil was held back and forth. And, you know, you have Nebuchadnezzar who got saved and you have bad kings and good kings. But God permitted the evil during the 70 years. Now, he reduces the evil with a man he called Cyrus to build the temple in Jerusalem. That's interesting. So the scripture then goes to Ezra chapter 1, verses 5 to 6. Then the heads of the fathers of the houses of Judah and of Benjamin and the priest and the Levites with all whose spirits God had moved. Notice that God moved their spirits. They arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all of those who were around them, they encouraged them. They gave them articles of silver and gold with goods and livestock and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. So God brings to play this situation where people give in order to encourage the people going back to Jerusalem. That's interesting because that hasn't happened before and other than Egypt and that hasn't happened. So that's fascinating. Now, with that in mind, the end of captivity was discernible because the gold and the silver offerings from the people, the people had given offerings to Jerusalem, to the people going back to Jerusalem, all this offering, and they said, go. Isn't that interesting? All right, well, let's go on then to the next scripture. It comes to us from Ezra 1, verses 7 to 8. It says, King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem. And he put them in the temple of his gods. That's a pagan god. Well, Cyrus, the king of Persia, he brought them out by the hand of Meredith and the treasurer, that is. And he counted them out to Shalbashar, the prince of Judah. This is fascinating. So here you have all of the articles that were captured by Nebuchadnezzar and hauled to Babylon and put in the house of the various gods they have. And here Cyrus takes them back out and he counts them and gives them back to the people of Jerusalem. What an amazing thing. 
Now, this is interesting because the people of Jerusalem are going back to the city with a great deal of wealth from the house of Babylon. So that brings me to this point. The end of captivity is revealed. What the king had removed from the house of God when it was taken. Now, this is important because God gets every single penny. He gets it all back and he goes back to Jerusalem. You have to understand now, this position is that they're, they're in this amount of gold uh, with Ezra, and Ezra begins to take this gold back, but he requires no guard. And uh, this comes up later, and we want to mention this. We're going to get to it. But he requires no guard because he chooses to allow God to protect him. So he goes back across the desert to Jerusalem with all his treasure. It is an amazing story. So here we have evil being pulled back, and people of Israel going back to Jerusalem, this is the return. There are three returns. This is the return of the people to the house of Jerusalem. Results of Cyrus coming to the throne of the Empire of Persia was he developed a policy of releasing foreign people groups to go back and worship and establish their religious centers once again. So this is what Cyrus did for the nation of Judah and uh, conversely Israel. So right now I want to talk about uh, this return of the exiles from Persia. The book of 2 Chronicles and the book of Ezra both contain the edict of Persian King Cyrus releasing the Israelites who had been taken captive during Babylon's destruction of Judah. Jerusalem had lain desolate for 50 years, and Babylon's first wave of exiles had been captive for around 70 years. The scripture reminds the reader that their return had been prophesied the century before by the prophet Jeremiah. Yet, the return was not full. Israelites willingly remained in the Persian Empire, and those take the starring roles of the books of Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, probably Malachi, and possibly Joel. These post-Cyrus the Great exiles had two more mass returns to join on to. The first was led by Ezra, three kings after Cyrus the Great. In the ancient records, Ezra is called a scribe skilled in the law of Moses and a man determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, obey, and teach it. Around 457 BC, Ezra the scribe priest led a detachment of Israelites back to Jerusalem carrying an abundance of treasure without an official guard. Ezra wanted to behave the way he taught, that God is the protection for his people. And so Ezra declined the royal guard accompaniment offered to him and instead prayed. The last official return to Jerusalem happened 13 years later under the supervision of Nehemiah, the Jewish cupbearer to the Persian king. The goal of this return was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The first return ordered by Cyrus began the reconstruction of the temple the second return under Ezra completed the temple, and the third return rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. What does the UFO movement not want you to know? What is it that the Bible says about the UFOs seen and heard? Join us as Janice, Corey, and Rod entangle themselves in the UFO movement and the Bible. What does it mean to contact an alien species? Is there such a thing? What does it mean to have a close encounter of the third kind? Join us this month as we work through the images of UFOs, aliens, and more of the conspiracy movement ideas. For $25 or more, write to us for your DVD of the UFO movement and what it means to us now. 
in the United States, write to us at Post Office Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to us at Post Office Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, Canada, L9W 5G2. For faster service, you can call us in Canada at 519-940-8338 or in the United States at 724-733-8336. For a gift of $25 or more, you can also go online to give and download your video now at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Ask for UFOs and the Bible. Thank you for staying with us, and it is important that you read through the Bible. Now, next time on the weekend, we're going to be looking at the Bible. We're going to be looking at Haggai 1 and 2, and we'll discover giving to God means that you do not give to yourself. How does that work? It's a very interesting look, and we'll study that later. Right now, Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? Did you know that those who believe that our solar system is billions of years old have a lot of trouble explaining the magnetic fields of some of the planets? See, the problem is, if the planets truly are billions of years old, then their magnetic fields shouldn't be as strong as they are. This is not a problem for a solar system that's only thousands of years old, however. Let's explore. Many missions have been taken to explore and uncover the secrets of the universe. Missions to the moon, missions to other planets, and missions which have given us a view to beyond what we can even reach with spacecrafts. We have been able to study and watch these celestial objects and make discoveries. For example, using the logical laws of science, it has been demonstrated that the moon and earth suggest a much younger universe than what is popularly believed. In the same way, we will now use logical science to test the magnetic fields of the planets right here in our solar system. Like the Earth, many of the planets in orbit around our Sun also have strong dipole magnetic fields. Planets like Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. Like the Earth's dying magnetic field, these planets' magnetic fields are also dying. The question is, what is the rate of decay PhD physicist and biblical creationist Dr. Russ Humphreys has created a model that estimates the initial strength of each planet's magnetic field at the moment of its creation and then determines their present strengths based on 6,000 years of decay from electrical resistance. To determine the current magnetic field of any given planet, we need to know the starting strength of the magnetic field of the planet. Once this is known, we then reduce this by a 6,000 year decay. How can we determine what the initial starting strength of the magnetic fields were? Two parameters are needed. A, the amount of alignment of the original magnetic fields, and B, the size of the planet's conductive core. A larger core with more conductive materials will allow the electricity to last longer, which means the magnetic field will last longer. The mass of the planets are already well known, and the core size and its conductivity can be estimated as well. The only free parameter is the amount of initial alignment. This could be between 0 and 1, with 0 being no molecular alignment, and 1 being maximum alignment. Dr. Humphreys has found that the data is more consistent with 1. Plugging this value into the model gives a perfectly consistent value of the Earth's present magnetic field. Even more impressive is that this model successfully predicted the strength of Uranus and Neptune's magnetic fields before being measured by the Voyager spacecraft. Using the 6,000-year timescale model, Dr. Humphreys has demonstrated that perhaps the planets haven't been around for billions of years. After all, if they were around for billions of years, then the magnetic fields would not be so strong. Now, the way evolutionists get around this magnetic field problem is an idea they've developed called the dynamo theory, where fluid motions inside a planet's core could generate a magnetic field. The problem is, though, there are a lot of planets which completely defy this theory, and in some cases, they've even had to undermine 
their own models to explain things. As an example, many have simply given up trying to explain the magnetic field of Mercury altogether. Now, for more on this, you should go sign up for my online course at Bible Discovery Seminary and College. And Bible Discovery Seminary has his courses. Be sure and check it out at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Janice, what do you have? Well, in the exile, Nebuchadnezzar helped himself to all the articles that were in the temple of God. Now, on the exile's return, King Cyrus wants all of those articles to go back to Jerusalem with the the people who are going home. So, do you know how many articles were removed, counted, and returned? Corey, how many articles were removed? You know what, this is a really difficult question because right in those chapters, there are so many numbers that are listed of, of everything from articles to money. So, I know it's a lot, I know it's a few thousand, but I keep going back and forth between 3,000 or 6,000, I don't know, 3,000? <laughs> 3,000. She called 3,000. Well, you know what? It's a really good guess. Ezra chapter 1 verse 11 says, 5,400 articles were returned. All the holy articles were returned to the temple of God. They were stored for 70 years, essentially since Nebuchadnezzar removed them from Jerusalem. They were returned to the temple for their intended purposes. The first exiles returning to Jerusalem paved the way for all of those following. There is great strength as well as courage to be gathered upon our return to God. We know little about the training, but we know about these returnees who understood their mission. We say today, God, make me serve you. I want to know you. Today on the Strength in Your Mind segment, we have a great question for you. Where does the Bible say, Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands in his sight. Now, if you think you know the answer to that quote, that's a very complicated quote, but it's a very good one. And it's in the New King James Version. Go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click right there on Sound Minds. And it'll take you there. All the scripture is there, but I wanna bring you Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is alive and he's well. And he is the one who brought you this program, not me, Jesus Christ. And he said, if you believe in me, and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, he died on the cross, he rose again, then you will be saved. And so you pray and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I need you today, forgive me of my sin. The Quick Study Power Guide is a print companion to this program and its daily commentary. Write for yours or call 519-940-8338 and receive yours automatically every month. Call now and get your Power Guide.